Joining me today is Neil Herman, Fund Manager of the Henderson Smaller Companies Investment Trust, which invests in UK companies. Neil, thank you for your time today. No problem at all, Carl. Good to speak to you. You've outperformed the benchmark, the numerous smaller companies index, in 15 out of the last 17 financial years for the trust. What would you say has been the main driver behind this consistent level of outperformance? So what's the special source or the USP? Um, that's a very interesting question, actually. Um, look, I think, you know, we've, we've got a very um, consistent process and philosophy in the way we do things. Um, you know, we hasn't changed our the way, you know, the kind of the way we pick companies and construct our portfolios the last 18 years. So I think that's really helped drive those long term returns. And ultimately, think about, you know, how we've delivered that return. It's really been through stock selection. You know, the way we create value or create alpha is by picking the right companies that will do right, do well over the longer term. And I think that comes down to the core of the people. So I think I've got a really good team. So to me, it's about consistent delivery and application of our process and also just picking the right stocks. On average, you hold stocks for um, more than five years. What company have you held the longest? Are there any examples of companies that you've held for nearly two decades since taking over the management of the trust in 2002? It's a really interesting question, actually, because, you know, I can actually have a look back at the portfolio um, going back. Uh, to 2002. I mean, when I started um, uh, at uh, Janice Henderson and took over running the trust, we needed to do quite a lot of reconstruction of the portfolio um, because you want to get it into the shape that you want going forward. So just I had a look at the portfolio at the end of 2003 and where we are today, and it, it is a lot of change. I mean, obviously, understandably, um, you know, things move on, you know, you have things you want to sell. Um, a lot of companies have been taken over that period as well, really. But there were five names that were still still in the portfolio today from the end of 2003. So, you know, over 17 years ago. Um, and those were Bellway, so UK house builder. And the return, return of that stock since December 2003 is 720%. Renish Shaw, which is a high technology precision um, and calibration equipment manufacturer. Um, total return 1600%. Um, Rotalk, um, it's a kind of a manufacturer of actuators for the process and oil and gas industries. Total returns being 1,440%. Um, RWS, which is a patent translation and translation services business, total return uh, 3,700%. And then lastly, Victrex, which is a manufacturer of specialist uh, thermoplastic called Peak, total return 1,000%. So you can just see there the, the phenomenal returns you can get from taking a long term perspective on a very high quality growth companies. Around two thirds of the trust is in mid caps firms listed in the FTSE 250 index. Is part of the reason for this because you like to run your winners? And also, what causes you to sell a winner? Yeah, I think actually, you know, you look at the shape of the portfolio, and as you said, you know, run the winners is one of the reasons why we have that uh, behind mid-cap bias. But if you if you include the AIM stocks that we own that probably would fit in the 250, it's more like probably 70, 75% by size would be in, 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 the, in that kind of mid-cap area. Um, I think there's a number of reasons why we have that, that weighting. First up is liquidity. I mean, this the fund itself and the smaller companies has now just gone through a billion gross portfolio value. It's, it's quite a large trust. And we run other mandates alongside it. So we run about 1.7 billion in, in our um, small mid-cap strategy. So naturally, we just can't get involved in the very small companies in the UK market. So we don't really, we gravitate towards those larger small cap and mid-cap companies. Um, secondly, it kind of mirrors our benchmark. Um, you know, we're not benchmark slavish, but benchmark aware. Um, so it does the numerous index, which is our benchmark, is quite heavily mid-cap biased. The third point, I think, is one you mentioned about run the winners. Um, we don't invest in anything, you know, which is large cap. We invest in, you know, we invest in smaller mid-cap, the original point. However, if we, if those companies do well, and I think I mentioned the last answer of some of the companies that we've owned for the last 17 years, if they do well and grow and be successful, then naturally, um, you know, we are going to end up with a higher portion of mid-caps if we're making the right decisions. Uh, and lastly, I think, you know, relative quality and growth, we, we're not, we don't really care where we, we find our ideas. Ultimately, it's kind of finding the best companies can deliver returns for investors over the um, medium to longer term. And, you know, if that's in the mid-cap, that's in the mid-cap. But we're not, we're not kind of um, slavish to that. Um, what makes us sell stocks? Well, I think one of the things about running the winners, there is a natural point we dispose of things so when it gets to FTSE 100 that's a point when we cut the position so clearly we're not 
appeared to run a portfolio of FTSE 100 companies. So, for example, just unfortunately, Renishaw, which is um, one of those five I mentioned in the, in the previous answer, it actually went to the FTSE in, in this month, last month. So we will be disposing of that, unfortunately, in the next few months, but that's the natural way of things. And now, you know, disposals come down to, you know, things around changing our investment thesis, um, potentially valuation, um, changing the management or strategy. Um, so natural evolution of investment ideas. Part of your investment process takes into account environmental, social and governance factors. So what sorts of qualities do you look for in this respect? Uh, I think, you, you say, like you said, ESG has become an increasingly important factor in investing in the last few years, certainly, you know, when compared to a number of years ago. Um, you know, when, just point out, we're not an ethical fund. Um, you know, we, we haven't got exclusion lists regarding things that we don't invest in, but we do think ESG is very important. And because we're a large investor and also, you know, long term, you know, we don't have quite a significant influence on the management teams of the companies we invest in. So do listen to us. Now, I think, you know, we do think that companies that employ um, strong ESG, environmental, social and, and governance uh, criteria tend to be those long term winners. So we are looking for those criteria to be met by the companies we invest in. Um, and, you know, I think the kind of the, what we're looking for is a journey on ESG. You know, the companies that are kind of trying to deploy the right policies to move the right direction and improve their ratings. So I think that essentially companies that have the right ESG criteria ultimately will deliver a valuation premium over time. And could you name an example or two of a company in which you're using your shareholder influence to drive positive change? I think a really good example of that is we actually recently um, wrote to every uh, company in our investment portfolio and we kind of set out the ESG criteria which we which we felt was important for them to be um, to be applying. And so those are around essentially, you know, their, their plans to, to reduce carbon emissions and to go carbon neutral at some point in the future. Um, you know, things around the uh, diversity, um, both from uh, gender and ethnicity of the board members, um, issues around um, diversity and inclusion and, and a gender pay gap, um, you know, management shareholdings in the business. And also critically for us in terms of the short term was we said we would not support any company paying a dividend um, while they're receiving furlough uh, payments. Now, I think that letter has been well received. I think we've clearly set out what our, you know, kind of our criteria are what things we think are important in the short term. And I think certainly from the furlough perspective, we've had, you know, there's been significant, um, you, know, you know, kind of advance on that in that perspective. We've certainly been engaged with companies regarding their dividend policy. And a number of companies through our prompting have certainly been looking to repay furlough money to the government before they, re, before they start paying dividends. So I think essentially, you know, we're having some positive impact there on some of our portfolio companies. Neil, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Carl. Thanks for your time too.